The third session of the 11th Biennial Corporate Governance Conference, held by the Hong Kong Institute of Chartered Secretaries, focused on new strategies for the digital age. The first speaker, Ms. Julia Leung, Deputy Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director Intermediaries from the Securities and Futures Commission, gives her view on the implications for companies and corporate governance professionals to govern and regulate the digital age. It's really an um, honor to be here to talk about a topical subject, um, regulating in a digital age. Um, I, I am, as some of you know, that I'm in the business of licensing and supervising broker-dealers, fund managers, and licensed corporation. I'm not in the tech business, but there isn't a day that goes by without touching on the subject. It could be an application that our licensed corporation would like to use and whether this is in compliance with our rules. Now, the range of new technology that are, that, that are really fusing the physical, digital, and biological worlds is impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries. It is not a gradual evolution. It's actually a revolution. The resulting shifts and disruptions mean that we live in a time of great promise and also great peril. If firms are unable to adapt, and regulators fail to regulate new technologies to capture the benefits, this latest technology revolution may create significant new concerns and fragment the market. So in layman terms, how are we affected? Now, um, financial market is all about trust. My mom used to tell me that she goes to a certain bank branch in Hong Kong and talk to a specific member of the st staff to do his deposits or buy some investment products. Client relationships are built on years of interactions where banking staff earn their trust from customers by upholding their professionalism and treating clients with their best interests at heart. But as the internet of things proliferates, this operating model is rapidly changing. Well, many of you will have millennials at home. I have a son. And last time I dragged him into a bank branch is to open an account so that, so that he, uh, an account in the UK so that he, I can wire money for his tuition. The next time is to get a supplementary credit card. So millennials shop everything online and they split dinner bills, um, bills using mobile payment apps. The use of instant messaging on the smartphone is almost an obsession. Now, a growing breed of customers are banking and investing online, and this trend is going to be further catalyzed when we have the first batch of virtual banking having their license uh, granted by the HKMA in the, in the first quarter of next year. So the investment platforms that allow everyone to do banking, buy investment products, insurance product online, will be all done in one platform. That's on the retail level, but on the wholesale level, the rapid development in artificial intelligence and machine learning space has meant that firms can revolutionize the way that customer advice is provided, how trading orders are being executed, and how market surveillance is conducted. So is regulating in the digital age all that different from that of the last century? As our code and rules date back to a paper-based, face-to-face world, the code and rulebook needs to consider how to be updated. First of all, it's actually not that different because there are core values and principles that don't change. The general principles guiding the code of conduct, which is the Bible for licensed corporation, that governs the firm's conduct behavior are exactly the same in the new um, as it is in the old economy. They address conflicts of interest, which charter secretaries are very familiar with. They keep a fair and open markets, and these do not change, even if the advice is being delivered by a, an AI or robots. The robots must be programmed in such a way that customers are treated fairly, honestly, and with the best interests at heart. That said, our rubble needs to be updated where appropriate to accommodate the use of new technologies that makes the delivery on financial services more robust, efficient, 
and inclusive. And some of the examples. Now you take client onboarding. All the intermediaries are required to take all reasonable steps to establish the true and full identity of each of their clients, and that is conducted in a KYC, Know Your Client, of the, uh, to ensure that there are no um, anti-money laundering concerns. Now, onboarding is normally done face-to-face -face at a branch office uh, with a bank teller where the customer presents his or her ID card for checking. But this way of onboarding is posing challenges for firms or startups which don't have a network of bank branches and offices across the territory. Also, when one is doing banking and investment online, it's a fair question that these um, companies ask, why do you have to use paper? And make the, how, how, how can you make the procedure more uh, paperless? We issued a circular on July the 12th this year that provides guidance on the alternative acceptable procedures in opening securities accounts for individual clients. We leverage on the KYC procedures already done by bank, so when a bank uh, or the client already opens a bank account. So as long as the client agrees to do all the fund transfers into the securities account through the designated bank account under the same name, the account opening procedures can all be done online. We accept electronic signature, which means that you can just agree on the client ag um, opening uh, agreements. And to prove that you do have a um, bank account um, it, by the same name, you have to conduct a bank transfer from a Hong Kong bank account uh, to the bro your securities broker's account uh, in, by the same name. Now, once you open account, the next thing is placing client order. Now, clients typically place an order in the past, particularly by calling their brokers on a desk phone or mobile phone. Now, we require brokers to tape record the phone conversations for central record keeping purposes and for compliance monitoring process. Now, the popular use of instant messaging, that is like WhatsApp, WeChat, that comes with the um, smartphone is changing the way people communicate. Most IM service, that is the instant messaging service providers, do not provide users with tools to save, retrieve, or monitor the IM communications. And there are risks of hacking and messaging impersonating the client. But these issues are not insurmountable, and the IT uh, technologists are coming up with corporate solutions in co to these problems. So in May, we issued a circular that allows the use of IM provided that the firm has satisfied all the existing requirements, and in particular, the centralized record keeping. So I won't go into details because um, that's how some, some of the ways that we facilitate the use of IAM. Now with these uh, new FinTech opportunities also comes abundant new risk. Large volumes of customer and other business information are now stored in systems and, cl and clients rely on trading systems to handle transactions online. As the monetary value at stake is high, this has become a honeypot, which attracted its share of hackers. Around two years ago, we started getting a lot of um, reports from brokers who reported on the cybersecurity incidents. Most of them involved the hackers, which are based somewhere in Eastern Europe. They gain access to the customer's internet trading accounts, and and, and, and conduct some unauthorized trading. Basically, um, they sell down their, say, blue chips uh, and, then, and then use the proceeds to buy some really illiquid and small cap stocks. So it amounts to like tons of millions of dollars because in a securities account, you don't actually withdraw the money from the accounts, but basically they change they alter the uh, composition of these stocks. And it's a typical pump and dump game because they're buying into a liquid stocks, which they probably the, um, the, uh, the hackers partnered up with some bank actors and they probably positioned themselves to sell it in high, high prices. So it's a typical pump and dump scheme. Now to mitigate the hacking um, risks, we mandated uh, two-factor authentication, so two FAA. We, we do that along with 19 other baseline requirements for all internet brokers, or brokers who actually make use of online 
trading platform for their customers. And we are probably one of the first in the, uh, in the world to actually mandate uh, 2FA. Now, which means that since April of this year, you probably noticed yourself, when you log into an internet securities trading system, they would require um, 2FA, which is basically means that you have to utilize two out of the following three things. Um, first is what you know, that is your normal password. So when you log on, usually you ask you what's your password. So this is what you remember. Or the second is what you have, which could be a token that the, um, the bank or uh, given you, or a one-time password through your SMS system. So it's what you have. And the third thing is what, what you are. That is your, your fingerprint or facial recognition. So this is, um, as since, since the implementation of the system, we have at least up to now a more secured environment for trading. Now, a related risk is data privacy and security. The increased popularity of big data to gain customer insights and conduct risk analysis has raised awareness about data protection. We do know of apps which, when you download, would go through all the information in your mobile phone, including your photos, your emails, and use those data to determine your consumer needs or your credit scores. So they actually would already have your credit score before you apply for a loan. We're looking into areas of data governance standards, as well as third-party transfer and, and a data security framework, and with a view to providing more guidance. Um, on provision of financial advice, um, this could be a delicate thing. So if you walk into a bank branch and the relationship bank manager sells you a product, he or she is soliciting business. So in solicitation and recommendation of financial products, the staff has to ensure the product is suitable in all circumstances. That is, um, he or she has to conduct a risk profile of you, finding out your risk appetite, and, and, and the bank must have already performed some product DD and do the risk matching to see if it matches before you sell the product. But we've been often been asked, so what is solicitation and recommendation when you are in an online internet environment? So when you go on a website, it goes blink, blink, a lot of say, buy this, buy this, buy this. This is clearly solicitation. But if you go on the website, which lists all these investment products, um, and then they come up with the filters to, to see if you want your portfolio to be 30%, securities or 70% bonds, and uh, where you like to have A shares or have uh, Hong Kong equity. So all these filters and list of products, um, is it solicitation? This is where we have clarified by launching a public consultation on the distribution of investment products through online environment. Basically, what I described right now, uh, just now, that you have filters to filter down and find out what your investment needs are, that is not solicitation. It could be regarded as execution only and you can go on after all these filters, go and execute and buy your products. On the wholesale level, AI machine learning is not new. In the institutional space, equity trading by quant funds has long employed algorithm to execute large, amount, large orders to achieve particularly um, statistical benchmarks such as WeWAP. What's new with the algo programs these days is the use of fast number of hidden layers built on large data sets to drive investment decisions. It may be too complex for humans to comprehend. So what extra measures do we need to harness the risk posed to the firm, the clients, or the market at large? I was actually once asked at, at a forum this question. As machine replace human in the provision of financial advice, say robot advice or algo, what handle do we have over machines that are not complying with our standards? The answer is simple. We don't pursue robots or take them to our office for questioning, as fun as it may sound. We hold those who operate the robots and the algo trading responsible. And that includes the senior management of the firm responsible for implementing a robust governance structure, appropriate policy and procedures, 
with effective control to ensure reliability and security of the data and of cybersecurity. So a common thread that runs through the themes of regulating in a digital age is good governance structure. Good governance goes to the core of the value promoted by the Institute of Charter Secretaries. At its heart is the clear responsibility and accountability of the board and the senior management of the firm. When we say tone from the top, we refer to the culture of the senior management, which is the driver of proper behavior in the firm. So in, to heighten the awareness of senior management accountability and drive proper behavior, the SFC introduced the um, manager in charge regime, or what we call MIC regime. This is a very simple scheme to hold senior managers responsible for the conduct of the firm. The board is required to provide names of MICs in charge of eight core functions, including overall management oversight, key business lines, AML, information technology, etc. The initiative was already fully implemented in November of last year, and it's prom prompted our firms to revisit their management structure and strengthen corporate governance and senior management responsibility. We have seen a number of cases where corporate governance has improved. In one case, a global financial group substantially enhanced the structure of a licensed comp by appointing the group's senior executives to the board. It also established new management and operating committees reporting to the boards to better manage the business. Now, because of this exercise, the responsibility and accountabilities of committees and individual senior managers are now clearly delineated. Now, not all senior management are tax savvy to understand all the inner workings of the firm's machine learning, algo trading structure. So it's important to put in place proper governance structure and responsibility system. Hiring, hiring suitably qualified and experienced people uh, as MIC and adopt robust risk management policies and escalate the issues to the senior management or the board before it festers beyond control. Now let me conclude by recounting an encounter with somebody senior from a technology firm exploring to set up a financial market uh, to set up in Hong Kong. After an hour of meeting, he couldn't really understand why selling a fund online is different from selling a phone or some merchandise online. He was actually talking like an evangelist who comes to liberate the world from the shackles of re regulation to enable financial inclusion. So we are cognizant of the fact that the use of fintech could lead to better customer experience, cost reduction, financial inclusion, and increased productivity. We believe in blockchain and quite a number of other technologies, which is groundbreaking. And, but then being a blockchain company or a startup does not exempt it from complying with the securities regulation when it tries to raise a fund through initial con offer. They should comply just like an IPO or any funds that are sold to the public. We are living in a rapidly changing world, standing on the cups of revolutionary breakthrough in FinTech. But it seems that the adage, the more things change, the more they stay the same, still rings true. Some things don't change, such as the core value, uh, best interests of the customers, the fair and open market, the avoidance of conflict of interest, these fundamental principles and under, that underpin securities regulation and corporate governance will be the same in the new economy as well as the old. And that concludes my speech. Thank you. Our next speaker, Mr. Kenneth Wong, partner of Risk Assurance Cybersecurity and Privacy Lead from PwC China, Hong Kong, and Asia Pacific, talks about corporate governance challenges associated with cybersecurity in the current business and social environment. What I would like to do now is basically to try to also set the scene before I dive into more detailed discussion about what are some of the uh, risks and also mitigating uh, measures that you can potentially um, you know, think about in 
as part of your digital transformation uh, strategy or, or journey. I don't think these are news to, to you all, but what I would like to highlight as we have seen uh, over the past few weeks, months, or even years, I think the types and also the uh, level of impact uh, rising from cyber attacks have certainly uh, increased dramatically. So we have seen lawsuits from uh, the affected uh, parties uh, resulting in large sum of uh, money for penalty or settlement. We have seen uh, CEO, CIO, or CISO who have resigned because of all these uh, very uh, high profile uh, cyber uh, breach uh, incident. We have seen significant drop in share uh, prices uh, in, in one case, uh, as you can see on your right hand side, that affected significantly the offer price by another company to uh, buy out uh, Yahoo. And in Hong Kong here, we have also seen um, cyber attacks that have indeed impacted uh, their daily operations uh, in terms of uh, the branch. Basically, if you can recall from the incident that uh, happened to the travel agencies in Hong Kong here, they basically had to shut down uh, their branches for a few days after they had discovered the, the incident. So it, we're not just talking about the loss of customer data, outage of website, we are now talking about much more serious uh, implication as a result of uh, cy cyber incidents at these days. So di diving into um, some of the risk uh, factors uh, associated with the use of uh, big data analytics and also the artificial intelligence, as you can see from these slides uh, in the second box there. This basically um, is an example uh, in the US where a very big um, supermarket, they were very clever uh, in the use of uh, big data analytics and they were able to track and also predict uh, the buying patterns of uh, the customers. In this case, it was uh, basically a group of uh, pregnant um, teenagers or wo women. However, as the father um, find out about, you know, cue points um, sent to uh, his uh, teenage Girl. At that point in time, he didn't actually know uh, his uh, daughter was uh, pregnant. He on only find out uh, after you know discussing more uh, more detailed uh, de detailed discussion with his daughter, and he eventually find out his uh, daughter was uh, pregnant. But obviously, he wasn't very happy about the fact that Target was actually um, collecting and also profiling and targeting um, his daughter and sent very targeted coupons to his daughter. He actually uh, sued a target uh, in terms of uh, breaching the data privacy, uh, which according to his claim were not included in the terms and conditions uh, agreed between uh, his daughter and uh, target. So that, that was uh, basically an example of the kind of risk uh, that any organization should be aware of. Another um, example which is basically a case of collecting a vast amount of GPS uh, data points by a company called um, Strava. Strava is a um, health checking uh, software company and this uh, software is actually used uh, perhaps in, on some of the health checking devices that you might be uh, wearing, uh, Fitbit. And what, what they uh, did was uh, they basically uploaded um, at that point in time, it was more than uh, three, three trillion GPS data points onto the internet. Basically, I guess for self-promotion or marketing purposes to be saying to their customers or prospective customers about uh, how you know, widespread in terms of uh, their customers are uh, from a geographical uh, location perspective. But what they did not realize was uh, after um, the US um, army zoomed uh, into some of these uh, maps as identified from uh, the data, GPS point data uploaded by Strava onto the internet. What they did not realize are some of these uh, were indeed indications of um, military bases of uh, US uh, arm, army in the Middle East. So they got very ner nervous and, and then the US uh, army had to instruct 
uh, the soldiers uh, not to use uh, this type of uh, health checking devices, you know, tracking where, where they are, that can pose potential national security concern uh, to the uh, U.S. Arms, Arms Army. Now, another um, risk about, you know, the use of artificial intelligence, I don't think I need to tell you how AI is now becoming more mature, uh, is already being used in various uh, fields, in particular uh, chat, chatbot, uh, and also combining AI and big data analytics can be very powerful for uh, most uh, companies. However, there are also uh, drawbacks uh, in relation to the use of uh, AI. So when you look at this line here, obviously AI is um, trained based on the information that is fed by a human being. So in this example here, as you can see, uh, most pictures of wolves uh, the AI program uh, will fed has no in the background. As a result, the AI used this as the basis for identifying the object in the picture as a wolf. However, we as a human would look at the face of the animal in the picture and decide or judge this is a dog rather than a wolf, but the AI would uh, behave or make this decision uh, differently based, purely based on uh, the da data uh, fed into the uh, AI. And why, why does this uh, matter? So when you look at the different examples that I've tried to um, illustrate here, for example, um, the one on the uh, left-hand side, as you can see, the US courts have actually been using um, poorly uh, trained AI to identify the chances of a um, suspect re-offending. And the AI solution in this case rated the black uh, suspect to be much more likely uh, than the one on the left-hand side uh, re-offending, as you can see from the risk rating uh, at the bottom of uh, this slide here on the uh, left-hand left side. And again, the other example that I've shown to you, one by uh, WeChat, another one by uh, Microsoft, uh, that indicates that you know, there is still a lot that needs to be done in terms of feeding the right data and also filtering data into the a AI uh, before you know, that can become uh, mature. From a risk mitigation perspective, obviously I think Julia has also talked about this in terms of uh, making sure that uh, when you collect uh, data, in particular customer da data, you need to make sure you have obtained consent uh, from the customer in relation to the intended uh, use uh, of that customer data. And there have been also uh, cases when we talk about intended use of uh, customer da da data, you know, where you might include in your terms and conditions a very high level statement about the intended use, but the customer might not agree uh, with that in relation to the high level um, statement of the intended use. So there have been court, court cases uh, and an argument about you know the level of detail that should go into the uh, terms and uh, conditions as well, and the other risk is uh, I guess the use of uh, third parties, which is increasingly uh, the trend with uh, any companies, and 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 also when you pass on customer data to your third party service provider, you need to make sure the same level of security and controls and privacy me measures are upheld uh, by your third party uh, service provider as well. But before I talk about cryptocurrency, I should probably also you know, talk very at, at a high level um, that cryptocurrencies are built based on blockchain. And as one of the inherent risks or nature of uh, blockchain, the transition speed of blockchain um, can be very slow as opposed to traditional or conventional uh, payment efforts. So in the case of uh, Bitcoin, uh, it's roughly about seven uh, transactions per second as opposed to, uh, for example, uh, Visa, which I think is about 2,000 uh, transactions per second. In the case of uh, PayPal, it's around 120 uh, transactions per, per second. As a result, um, <coughs> we have actually seen um, companies or, or event organizer, and I've actually included on this side here, there was an example um, in uh, January uh, this year, there was a conference uh, dedicated to cryptocurrencies and uh, Bitcoin. The event organizer basically had to stop accepting 
uh, Bitcoin as their payment effort because they find the way of accepting Bitcoin uh, was uh, too slow and also the transaction was actually uh, very high. They find it to be too costly to be accepting the Bitcoin as the uh, payment uh, method. Another risk to also uh, be aware of is, is in relation to um, how much indeed have been uh, lost or stolen uh, through various means in terms of uh, cryptocurrency. So as you can see from um, <coughs> this slide here, as a matter of fact, up until uh, November uh, 2017, I don't have the latest uh, figure with me. As of the valuation uh, at that point in time, uh, 33 uh, trillion US dollars had been lost or stolen already through uh, exchanges or people losing uh, their private keys to access the uh, cryptocurrency they, that they might have bought or uh, you know, ha hackers are hacking into their crypto wallet, uh, you know, effectively steal, stealing uh, their cryptocurrency that they might have bought. I mean, sim sim similarly, uh, si uh, same as uh, any gold coins, cash, uh, they can be easily lost or, or burned or stolen, basically. So that shows you know, the types of uh, risk uh, for anyone, any organization uh, thinking about accepting uh, cryptocurrency as a way of uh, payment, the type of risk that you need to be aware of as well. Obviously, another risk is, uh, you know, from, from a regulatory uh, legal uh, perspective, I, I think we agree that there is still a very high degree of uh, regulatory or legal uncertainty out there in relation to uh, the acceptance of uh, cryptocurrencies. As a result, that is something any organization should be very well aware of. And here are some tips uh, that I would offer in terms of how we can uh, mitigate uh, these uh, different risks. So for example, from a security perspective, you need to make sure um, simple uh, security hygiene through the use of a uh, multi-signature authentication uh, method similar to uh, what uh, Julie has mentioned, but that equally applies in the crypto world uh, in terms of how uh, private keys should be securely maintained in uh, wallet, and ideally your uh, private key should be kept in uh, cold wallet, meaning it's not connected to the internet. That would provide a much higher degree of uh, security. And then from a volatility uh, strategy perspective, obviously I think this is a uh, risk uh, everyone should now be very uh, aware of, uh, as you have seen from the last uh, few weeks in particular, given the dramatic volatility of the various uh, crypto uh, currency that we have seen. So you need to put in place a robust um, you know, crypto holding and investment strategy uh, in, in place to mitigate the risk associated with the volatility. And <clears throat> also given the risk associated with uh, keeping uh, cryptocurrencies with exchanges, if you don't have the confidence and resources um, for uh, keeping internal resources, making sure you have internal um, and sufficient resources to put in place or, or, or protect the digital wallet for the custodian of your crypto uh, currencies. If you decide to go with uh, any crypto exchange for the custodian of your cryptocurrency, then obviously uh, you need to make sure you know you have done a very proper due diligence with those uh, crypto exchanges. You know, doesn't matter how big they are, still subject to very significant uh, cyber attack uh, risks out, out there. On the last topic here in relation to the use of cow. I, I'm a big fan and advocate of the adoption of uh, cloud technology, given that how um, difficult I have seen in terms of uh, you know, maintenance and, and how difficult it is to recruit uh, cybersecurity professional in any organization, even for us it's a challenge uh, for PwC to retain uh, people uh, in this field. As a result, I highly you know, recommend, uh, in particular for those uh, small, medium enterprises who may not have uh, the resources and scale to uh, maintain uh, cybersecurity. <clears throat> so from a um, benefits perspective, these are some of the benefits, in particular cloud can significantly um, reduce your capex 
uh, IT expenditure can increase your speed to market. Um, and most importantly, from my perspective, it can significantly enhance your security um, posture by leveraging cloud technologies, uh, resources uh, offered by uh, some of the very reputable cloud service providers uh, out, out there. And then from a cyber technology uh, perspective, which um, <coughs> basically some of the uh, challenges that we have also seen from our security investigations after incidents uh, that we have uh, hand handled with our clients. These are some of the you know, very basic security hy hygiene that can be provided by cloud service providers, but they are challenges uh, that our clients are often faced to you know, keep all of this up to date uh, in their internally hosted environment. But if you can outsource some or all of this to reputable cloud service provider, it can significantly reduce your uh, security uh, risk. Another risk in relation to the use of cloud uh, is in terms of you know, whether you know where you store your data, in particular uh, customer da data. Now from this slide, basically this is a case um, between the uh, US government and uh, Microsoft in relation to whether the US government uh, would have access to uh, non-US uh, customer data sitting in a non-US uh, ser server. Luckily, the US government uh, lost this battle in, in this case, but I think this, this is something any organization will need to make sure they, get, they, they have a good handle in terms of whether they know, you know where their customer data is located uh, at their cloud service provider, including any subcontracting arrangement that might exist between their cloud service provider and the subcontracting parties engaged by the primary uh, cloud service provider as well. So the last risk in relation to the use of uh, cloud, which is also the most common risk that we have seen is indeed what we call configuration uh, risk. So many organizations that we have seen, yes, agree with the benefits of uh, using cloud. So they've gone and talked to uh, the cloud, they prefer uh, cloud service provider, but they might have gone too fast without you know, thinking um, carefully um, in the uh, journey of adopting cloud, uh, in particular in relation to how they should set the various uh, configurations uh, to limit uh, access to the different uh, resources and parameters. In one of the cases that we have assisted in an in incident investigation, after they have moved to the cloud, they effectively gave the whole company the same uh, access in some cases uh, privilege access to the network to everyone with, within the company without realizing that they have done that uh, actually doing the cloud uh, migration pro process that had indeed resulted in a very significant hacking incident and we got called in to help them to remediate and also investigate uh, the cause of the um, in incident as well. So that's basically a summary of the different types of uh, risk and also risk mitigating measures uh, that uh, any organization should uh, include and think about as part of your uh, digital uh, strategy. Mm -hmm.